Good morning. Our text today begins in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Matthew 5, verse 21. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever, is, uh, whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there, remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. As we've seen, Jesus has said, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And our first test case for that is the commandment, you shall not kill. One of the most straightforward and simple commandments in the law. Right? It's really, really easy. I think for most of us to keep that commandment, don't kill. But Jesus tells us that we have misunderstood what God means by that law, or rather there is more for us to understand. It is not God's way of saying that everything short of murder is acceptable. Whenever he says do not kill, he is not giving us license for everything right up to killing. Instead, what God is doing whenever he commands, do not kill, is that he's showing us what he is for. God has created man for peace, for love, for reconciliation. He's created man for harmony, for, for unity, for oneness. And murder is the strongest possible denial of the peace and love that God has intended for man. And so it's forbidden. And the one who murders, Jesus says, will be liable to judgment. But Jesus tells us that anything short of peace and love makes one just as liable to judgment. Notice it's the same punishment that is rendered. He says, you've heard that it said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Same punishment. Right. If you're not in for peace, if you're not in for reconciliation, Jesus says the same punishment awaits you as for a murderer. Now this ought to make sense to us. Right? I mean, obviously, it's way more expansive than the commandment, don't murder. But the connection ought to be intuitive to us. Jesus is not teaching a new lesson here, but one which Israel ought to have known from the beginning. Right? It's a lesson that we can still see close to the beginning of everything in Genesis chapter 4. Right? The story of Cain and Abel begins with anger and strife. And then it turns to murder. And the connection between those things is drawn out for us. The Cain's anger, his jealousy over his offering not being regarded, whereas Abel's offering was regarded, that anger leads him to kill his brother. Now, that connection is there for us. What Jesus is teaching here is intuitive to us. This is why elsewhere the Apostle John tells us that to hate your brother is to be a murderer like Cain. He tells us that in 1 John chapter 3. And that's precisely what Jesus is saying here on the Sermon on the Mount. To hate your brothers, to be angry with them, is to be a murderer. And again, as we have seen, bears the same consequence. In fact, I think Jesus expects us to have Cain and Abel in mind as he's talking about this. 
Right, again, that's, just, that's the natural connection that, the, that, that we jump to whenever he connects murder and anger. Well, of course, Cain and Abel are in view. And I think Jesus expects us to have them in mind because the very next thing he talks about is when you are offering your gift at the altar. And of course, Cain's anger originates in God's rejection of his offering. So having put that in our minds, Jesus says, let's, let's talk about being angry at the altar. Let's talk about being angry as you are going to offer your sacrifice. Except, that's not quite what Jesus says. Now, I've heard plenty of lessons acting like that's what Jesus says, talking about how if you come into worship and there's something between you and somebody else, you know, where you, uh, you know, you're angry at somebody else, you go and you make that right first. Right? And that's certainly true, but that's not exactly what Jesus says in this passage. He actually turns the tables on us a bit. Whose responsibility is it to seek peace? Is it the angry brother, the one who is committing murder in his heart? Well, yes, it is his job to seek peace. But Jesus says, don't stop there. He says, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. It's not if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that you are angry at your brother, that you have something against your brother. It's if you are offering your gift and remember your brother has something against you. If you remember that your brother is angry at you, Jesus says, leave your gift there before the altar, go and reconcile, and then come back and make the offering. And now Jesus has just taken this, this lesson about being committed to peace, to love, to harmony, to reconciliation. He has just taken it yet to another level. Our commitment to peace and to love is to be so radical that we go out of our way for it, even when we're not the ones with the problem. Right? It would be easy for us to come in and say, you know, as we're going into worship, oh, I remember so-and-so's got this issue with me. So-and-so's got a problem with me. Well, his problem. I'm not the one who's mad. But that's not what Jesus presents us with here. He says, if you go in with your offering and you remember there in front of the altar that your brother has something against you, stop what you're doing and go and reconcile first. Right? It is so important, he says, that it is, it's worth interrupting and offering for. And it's worth doing that even if you're not the one who's angry. You just know that somebody else is angry with you. It is worth stopping at that point to go and reconcile. We don't get to make some excuse like, oh, it's the other guy's problem. It's not my problem. Right. Tell that to Abel. Well, it's just Cain's problem. All right, what good does that do for Abel? All right, the, in the final estimation of things, it doesn't do Abel a lick of good to say, ah, it's just Cain's problem. None of my concern. Now, obviously, Cain is in the wrong. And obviously, this, uh, this other brother who is angry with you is in the wrong. And yet, the teaching is for us. Now, Jesus finishes with a, a relatable teaching that should convince us, I think, at a practical level, that we ought to be this radically committed to reconciliation. You look at what he says in verses 25 and 26. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. 
Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So here we have a similar circumstance. Some other person's got a problem with you. Again, you're not the one with the anger problem in this situation. Somebody else is taking you to court. And Jesus simply invites us to consider what you would do in those circumstances. Are you going to get on a high horse and say, oh, it's not my problem? No, you're on the way to court. You're going to try to settle that. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court. Everybody understands that if you're being dragged to court, the first thing you should try to do is settle. Everybody knows that it is better to settle than to go into arbitration with a judge. Right? And everybody knows at least one person who has refused to settle and has gotten far worse than what they had bargained for by actually taking something to court. Now, if we can see in these circumstances why peace, love, and reconciliation are so desirable, then we ought to learn the lesson. We ought to learn to seek peace in all circumstances, not just when we're threatened with a judge. We ought to learn to seek reconciliation at all times and thereby do the will of our Father in heaven. Because Jesus says that is what we are supposed to understand from the commandment, you shall not murder. The call this morning is that God has shown us his own radical commitment to reconciling with us. God's not the one with the problem. We're the ones with the problem. We're the ones that wrong him constantly. And yet he takes the first steps at reconciling. Jesus, what Jesus is commanding here in this passage is something that God himself has done. And he doesn't have the problem. He's not the one with the problem. We're the ones with the problem. And yet he takes the first steps to reconcile. He offers forgiveness and eternal life to all who will obey him. And he did that by sending his son to live as a perfect sacrifice to die because of our sins. He didn't have to do that. Again, he very easily could have said, ah, their problem, their fault, let them all burn. And yet, he went to such great lengths to reconcile us to himself. And so we ought to do the same for each other. God offers these things to those who will obey him through his son. So we invite you this morning to believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Confess Jesus is Lord. Be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins. And walk according to this way that Jesus has shown us. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come as together we stand and sing.